Hello, thanks for listening to Acting Related, the MySite.actor podcast. I'm your host, Frank Prendergast, and my guest today is actor and qualified career coach, Andrew Macklin. Andrew is a graduate of Bristol Old Vic Theatre School. He's worked with uh, companies such as the RC, the Old Vic and the Abbey Theatre. He's toured internationally in award-winning productions and he's worked on screen productions for the BBC, ITV and RTE. During lockdown, Andrew started a YouTube series called Creative Career Talk, which I highly recommend. I've, yeah, I've been thoroughly enjoying it. And today we chatted about some of the common threads that have come up in his chats. We talk a lot about the importance of building your network. We also chatted about this concept of going all in as an actor. And since we're nearing the end of the year, we also had a chat about New Year's resolutions, why Andrew isn't a huge fan of them, and the importance of having a more frequent practice of reflection and taking a solution-focused approach. So, let's chat. Andrew, thank you so much for joining me for chat. Uh, really, really delighted to have you on here. Um, we're gonna, we've got loads of stuff that we want to chat about, but I have to ask you about something specific before we get into all that, which is, I noticed on your resume that you were in an episode of Doctor Who. I was, I was, I was indeed. Yeah, I think it was. Um, I think it was last year. I filmed this with the year before last. I think it definitely came out at the beginning of this year. So back when, uh, when the year was more normal, uh, I think it came out then. But yeah, I mean, it was. Um, it's look, it's it's great to be in something that is, I guess, really big in that there's an international reach. And that a lot of people really like. Yeah. <laughs> so it would have been in a few things, plays as well, that people might not have liked as as wonderfully as they do Doctor Who. So, I mean, it was great to be involved in that. And it's a big uh, beast of a thing. And yeah, yeah and I guess the storylines are great in that as well. And yeah, it's just great to be, they, they'd obviously do a lot of work um, together as a kind of a film unit. So just being around people that really like each other and are really good at what they're doing is, is always fun as an sure. actor. Yeah, it's um, I'm not caught up on my Doctor Who thing. I was saying to you the other day, I'm actually like, I am a big Doctor Who fan, but I um, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I got through um, a season of uh, Peter Capaldi, and uh, I think I'm, in, I'm actually in the middle of a Peter Capaldi season, and I have no idea why I stopped actually, but I did. Uh, and I hear that they're taking it off Netflix now, so I'm going to have to catch up over Christmas. And then I've got to find the uh, I'm going to have to find the Jodie Whittaker Doctor, which I'm really excited about. And I, yeah, I just haven't haven't caught up, so I'm looking forward to seeing your episode. Um, was that uh, was it was it a day's work? Was it uh, what? I think it was about maybe three three days in total. Nice. Like, I think they do a thing where they kind of book you for a week, right? In case filming runs over or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it was about three days in total. Um, part of me was a little annoyed that because uh, half that series was filmed in South Africa and the other half in South Wales. So oh, wow, right. Part of me was a little bit... Yeah, 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 in yeah. South Wales uh, quarter. But yeah, it was it was three days down there and um, a lot of it was filmed in sort of national parks down in Wales. So you've got a lot right. of the pub walking around, which means they have to like hide Cybermen using kind of bits of curtain and cloth as they're running around and stuff. So it's... Um, it's oh, surprisingly nice. so, open as a set. <laughs> nice. So there, you were in. You were in an episode with Cybermen. Yeah. Now I don't. I've not watched a lot of Doctor Who myself. So apologies to Doctor Who fans, I guess. But my my partner <laughs> definitely is a huge fan. So she was able to fill me in and all the stuff as to the context of Cybermen and you know where yeah. they are at this age and you know what Time Lords are and that kind of stuff. So I had some in in house resources there. Cool. I'd say you'd actually. I'd say you'd make a good Doctor as well. Uh, I don't think I'm quite there on the on the casting brackets, but I mean, I think that that I think that's an incredible part. Actually, there's yeah. so much freedom in that. It's a little bit like a sort of, I guess, a TV Hamlet. You know, I mean, everyone can bring a lot to it. It seems like there's so many ways you can go with it. Yeah, so I think one of the best parts knocking about, and I think Jodie is, is an incredible job with it. She's got a lot of natural fun about her as a human, anyway. Sure, so, um, I think you'll enjoy the differences. There. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm looking. Yeah, I'm looking forward. I can't believe I haven't. Uh, yeah, I can't believe I haven't caught up yet. Um, but yeah, you've been doing. So you've been doing this series of of chats. Um, a little like myself, actually. I think you you started in in lockdown as well, didn't you? Um, and they're called uh, Creative Career Talk. And the the kind of the tagline is, "What does it mean to live well as a creative in the world today?" Um, which I just think, yeah. I mean, they've been, it's been a it's been a fantastic series. Um, really it's one of those things like it's really insightful and also um 
I have found like I found my podcast a great way of just feeling managing to stay a little bit connected. Um, and similarly, your series of chats have made me feel a little bit more connected to the industry as well, because otherwise uh, I have just been in my house like <laughs> like everybody else. But I just thought we might have a chat about like uh, across the series. Um, and you've you've taped quite a few of them at this stage, a lot more, a lot more than I have. Uh, and I was just wondering if you had come across through lines or common elements throughout them that that maybe we could have a chat about as we kind of come to a, the end of the year. Yeah, thanks. It's a great question. And yeah, great, great to hear that you, you found them insightful. Um, yeah, I guess the, the through lines uh, that have stuck out to me as being really clear when you, I guess when it's like someone playing a note as you're listening to each one of them and talking to each person and there's some notes that are just hit repeatedly and you're like, oh, that is a real thing. And I guess for me, maybe the first one is around um, networking, not so much networking as I guess building and sustaining a, a group of people that right. you like working with and, yes. and, and work and developing that. I mean, everyone spoke on that at some point. And I thought it was really interesting because at least I think sometimes at least as an actor, it can feel very much like you're a lone gun. And that's, mm-hmm. I think, some of the ways in which, at least when I was being trained, that was the, the way I, I was sort of trying to see it in a way. You know, you'll be existing in the world as an independent character. You'll occasionally be brought into something to be a part of it. Yeah. So it was really interesting to see people talk so much about that. And I think it gives people so much, actually. Um, I mean, there's a talk with Tom Cruise, uh, and he talks quite a lot about that. I think really clearly around right. setting up those uh, and really investing a lot in that, uh, and really being, I think, really intentional around who you want to connect with. I mean, his first sort of things were very much around identifying, you know, who really excites you out there, who are you really passionate about working with, and intentionally kind of working towards them, which I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And by working towards, I don't mean in a very, you know, transactional sense of hunting people out and make them work with you, but sharing the fact that you're really interested in what they're doing, that you're kind of inspired by it mm. and would really want to, to work with them. Um, and that was something that's come up again and again in a lot of the talks around just connecting with people that really inspire you. And I think that connecting process is much easier if you are interested in what they're doing as well, as opposed to, oh, that person might be useful for me to be around is a very different way of engaging with someone as opposed to, Jesus, they're doing great stuff. And, you know, God, I'd like to be involved in that at some point. Yeah. Very different. Um, I guess other things that, that have come up maybe, I mean, one thing that comes up a lot as well is, for, yeah, the idea of being able to, to pr- progress or develop in some way. So there's a lot of people who got restless in the positions that they were in because they weren't allowed to develop in some way. So there was like, I wasn't learning a lot in where I was and I felt like I couldn't actively learn a lot. So actually I decided to do a bit more of this thing because I could actively engage with it. Right. Which led to the next thing. Uh, so a lot of frustration I noticed in, in some people and, and as well as in the coaching stuff, which I guess we'll talk about later, is around that idea of I can't quite progress in where I am. And, and some part of that is around the nature of being freelance to a degree. Or right. I think the nature and way people view that. So people often think that, I guess, I'm freelance, therefore I have to be an individual, not necessarily connecting with others. And sometimes just the setup of freelance work is a little bit like that. Whether sure. there's more time in a group, there's more of a sense of, I'm developing with a group of people and I can feel that. Yeah. So there's a bit of that. And um, I guess the last one is not really a common theme, but it was one thing that stuck in my head that I that uh, I thought that's really good actually. And I think more people not should think of it that way, but it might be more useful for more of us to think of it that way. And it was yeah. um, uh, I think Jessica Danheiser, who's a, um, a composer of, of music for TV and film. And uh, she works a lot and is, you know, very successful in what she's doing. And she mentioned the idea of being the arbiter of your own medium. Uh, and she referenced it in the sense of, you know, she was like, someone she'd worked with a lot who was sort of mentoring her a little bit saying, kind of helping her out going, you know, she's like, look, a client who is looking at your music just wants your music to do one thing. And so if your music is sort of not where you'd like it to be, what you offer them, they'll probably likely just to go, yeah, look, that's grand. That'll do. And his advice to her was sort of, look, you are the arbiter of your own medium. You are the expert to a degree. 
right. on what you can do. And you've got a real clear sense of actually there is more, this can be better. And his argument going, yeah, you might be happy with this client, but actually I know there's about 20% more in this. So give me one more day and let me put something into that. And right. I think that's a much more interesting perspective and perhaps empowering one to come at as opposed to the one of, you know, I'll just go with whatever someone else might be happy with. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Hmm. The, ne- the, the, the building a network one is really interesting because, uh, are you familiar with Bonnie Gillespie at all? I have seen one of our two of our books, and I think that they're on a list somewhere. They're, sure, they're perfect, yeah. but they're not read as yet. There's a, a long list. I read, I read her book. Um, I've lost track of when now, a number of years back. But at the time, uh, I kind of, I kind of read it and felt a bit like an idiot because it was like it was just such uh, common sense in a way. But one of the things she said was, you know, this is an industry of relationships, and it was like a light bulb went off in my head because, um, you know, I do digital marketing and I do acting. And I was doing all this stuff on like on the digital marketing side because it was business and I understood that. And, I, you know, and I understood that in business, it's about relationships and it's about your network and it's about and I just wasn't applying any of that to the acting world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to the degree that um, when I was called or when I was when I was called for to audition for something, I was I was trying to be like in adverted commas professional. And so if, you know, if the casting director or the director or whoever was in the room was, you know, asking me, you know, how, you know, how have you been or what have you been up to or how was your weekend or anything like that? I was being very kind of professional and to the point of almost being curt because I was like, well, they're just, they're just, that's their job. They have to ask me that. I'm not going to waste their time telling them what my weekend was like, (laughs) you know, instead of just being a human in the room and forming relationships with people and, you know, being normal <laughs> yeah I, I mean in fairness though to those situations i guess the stakes are high so I, I think it's a natural reaction to you know overthink those um but i mean someone said something to me years ago a, a similar insight uh that you had in that situation was when someone said to me i think i was talking about wanting to work uh, at the rsc you know it was years ago and i was like oh that's a place i really want to work in and, you know and how do you get into those buildings and i remember her going it was a friend of mine she was like look it's not a building you got to stop thinking about these things as buildings. They're people. Sure. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? As in like, yeah. find out who the person is that's involved with that. And I was like, God, you're right. I just look at these. I imagine these things, as these impenetrable buildings. Sure. And you can't have much of a relationship with that. You know, you can, you can talk to people, but not buildings really. Yeah. Yeah. And I know my, I think my very, very, my very first guest was um, Sean O'Connor, filmmaker. And he was talking about networking and he was just talking about how it's, it's such a mistake to like temper your enthusiasm in those uh, situations. And he was just saying, you know, that he loves film. He loves talking to people about film and he loves it when someone talks to him about film, but people get into these situations and they start to, again, in inverted commas network. And Mm -hmm. a bit like you said, they're kind of like, well, what can this person do for me instead of like, yeah, just having the chats about film or, um, or telling someone that you love their work. Uh, or you know whatever whatever it is and I think you know yeah, I think you made a really good point as well that when people go into that like networking mode they're looking for what people can do for them ultimately and the I think all the best networking is done from well is there something I could do for this person mm-hmm. is there some way that I can help them is there some way you know even if it's not even if it's not a direct kind of like, oh, I, <laughs> I'm not talking about like, oh, I'd be brilliant in your play or, but even yeah, just, yeah. you know, making introductions or, um, and that's another thing, isn't it? That like, there is still a, a little bit, I, th- I do think it's improving, but I still think there's a little bit, like you said, of the, the kind of you're doing it on your own and you have to kind of protect everything. Um, so I know, I know that there is, let's say there's a, uh, there's a, there is definitely a, a section of people who are still very precious about the work or about even letting people know that something is going on or, or that kind of thing. And I just think, I don't know, I just think uh, the, the, the community requires us to be kind of generous with all that. Mm-hmm. How, how do you mean, how do you mean by precious? Well, you know, uh, 
people being you know very cautious about like telling someone that they have an audition or telling someone that something is casting or uh i just i still i just still see a little bit of that about and it's a it's um i just think it's un- unfortunate yeah I, I guess yeah i mean i can i, I understand it uh, at the same time i understand how it's not necessarily useful over time i mean I, i've always felt when it comes to the casting stuff that you're just so different, even if it is another Irish actor of the exact same age going in there. You know what I mean? Everything that I do when I'm in there is going to be different to what they do. And so the, the real chance, yeah, yeah. casting wise, it's going to be one or the other. It's not a question of sort of losing out to a degree. But I think, you know, part of that is systemic, you know, part of, I think, the way in which maybe actors, and maybe a lot of us are kind of trained to think to a degree is around that sense of there's only a few positions and as much as you want to be friends with the other people around you, you know, they might be taking your work. Uh, and this is a sort of perspective. Doesn't help reaching out to people or talking with them. Do you know what I mean? It's it's yeah. not particularly useful. But I think that can take time to really grow into maybe. And again, I think, you know, if you do spend that time building your tribe, building your, your network, your community, I mean, uh, the people that I'm connected with here in Cork, like we have, you know, we're connected via messenger groups where we do let we do let people know. Oh, I've just heard this is casting, or I've just heard. So, I think, yeah, the the importance of building your own your own tribe of people who are like minded, people who are of the same the same spirit is just yeah, it's just it's just massively important. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's that step from I guess um, independence to to interdependence. So, independence being mainly around the kind of self esteem needs of. I need to be seen like I'm doing really well, really good. Um, and sort of, I guess, developmentally, the next stage beyond that is more of the interdependence sort of, you know, taking responsibility for what you need to do, but also a sort of a sharing, more of an outward look as opposed to an inward look of what do I need? What do I sure. need? Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, and actually, so another another thing that, I'm, that I'd love to talk to you a little bit about is and I, I, yeah, that sounds now like I'm focusing on all the negative things, <laughs> which I normally, I normally try not to do, especially in the podcast, even if I am a little bit of a cynical person generally. But um, the, I also, uh, I just, I noticed this thing, and unfortunately, a lot of it is is spending too much time on Twitter. A lot of the, a lot of the negative things <laughs> that I notice come from spending too much time on Twitter. Uh, but this. Um, I still see this attitude of, you know, that you have to go all in as an actor in order to make it. And that, you know, we had, oh no, I've forgotten his name. Um, the actor who was, he was, it was a, an American actor and he was like photographed working in, I think, Target. And there was this big thing made of it. And, and that, you know, it's not just at, at, uh, at his level, but, you know, at our level as well, people are very, 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 cautious about saying that they have anything going on other than acting and I was listening I I can't actually remember which of your talks that I was listening to but I just remember there was a little bit of talk about um uh, about well about building resilience in a, an acting career or at least that's the way I interpreted it and that made me think about the the economic I think actually it may have been when you were chatting with Deirdre Dwyer because you were talking mm-hmm. about um the reality of the economics of of having a creative career Mm -hmm. um and that just yeah it just got me thinking about you know i i have digital marketing in the past i've always tried to really keep like acting and digital marketing separate and not have digital people who were coming to me for digital marketing know that i was an actor and vice versa and just more recently like for one thing it's exhausting (laughs) trying to keep them that separate Mm -hmm. so more recently i've been like no i you know what there's creativity in both i'm just going to find the common elements in both of them and you know I used to, you know, be worried that that clients would think if I got an acting gig, I'd be gone from their project or, and that's just not how I work. I mean, I work on a, a project basis. So if I have time to do this project, I'll take it on. If I don't, I don't take it on. Um, but yeah, sorry, very, very long winded uh, intro to a quest to, to a, a conversation. <laughs> but I was just wondering again, in your chats about the economics and in your chats about the, about, um, creative careers and and how we negotiate them what your feeling on on that has been uh really good question yeah it's something i think about a lot myself really and would have gone through as well many stages of 
Uh, I mean, I think as a sort of a spectrum to be looking at it, I, I think the sort of home to prison like spectrum is a good one. And I think uh, just in a personal perspective, I guess I would have spent maybe the first 10 years definitely of, of my career going all in, so to speak. Um, of, and I think all in for me meant uh, I will plow all of my attention, work and effort specifically into the, I guess, idea of being an actor uh, to the cost of everything else. Mm-hmm. So just, you know, that's that's the main focus. Yeah. Um, and look, there's some benefits to that, to the degree of, you know, you, you you can learn a lot and you can move forward to a degree with that. And there's a lot of deficits as well around that that are sussed out over time, I think. Um, and, and so I guess for me, then over time, I started to find, like you were mentioning with your own sort of work, you know, design wise, there's creative other elements. So for me, I guess I started to kind of think about, well, what else, you know, I don't want to spend as an actor a lot of time working in pubs because that's just, it's killing me. <laughs> it's sure. on the ping. And so eventually I kind of stumbled across the idea of doing kind of facilitation and teaching a bit of acting. Because at least I'm using my skills in that way and I'm moving in those, using those same muscles. And I guess over time then I was doing more of that and it fit in really well with acting. So I could drop it and leave it as I needed to. I felt really right. good about it. I was like, yeah, this really satisfies me. This is really fulfilling. This is great. So the time when I'm not working, I'm doing something that I kind of care about that keeps the actor activated in me. Um, and I recognize a bit of shame in that, oddly. You know, people go, you go to auditions and be like, so what have you been doing over the last, you know, month or two? I would have been doing some really cool projects and different sort of, you know, community groups with acting or whatever. And I noticed a sense of me going, oh, actually, I'm really proud of what I've been doing, but I don't feel in this context like I can say it. Uh, and sure. then there was something in my own head kind of going, Jesus, what is that? Well, why can I not say that? And there is some sort of I- identity or idea that we have or we're presented we should have around being an actor. That means you don't do any of anything else. And it's not reflective of reality. Yeah. As we know, there's a lot of statistics around, you know, your 2% or 4% of actors that are in that situation. Yeah. Uh, so I guess personally on a personal scale, I began to kind of, break down that idea a little bit and go, well, actually, if I'm going to make this, I do feel a little imprisoned by the identity of actor. If that means that I can't do the other other things I'm interested in some way. And, you know, I got into acting because I was following interests. I was following stuff I was excited and passionate about quite freely. And so at a point for me as an actor, I was, I recognized that I was, I'm not doing that. I'm cutting off some stuff that could definitely support acting out of this idea so I'm breaking that down more. I was like, well, look, how do I how do I balance this? You know, how can I use the things I'm naturally interested in, develop those, while also, you know, allowing the room for to ensure that acting is always a part of that. And it's like an umbrella in my head, acting is the top of it. And then there's other things that I do off the back of it. And they're really interlinked in a sense. So I, I think that for me, at least, has created a certain amount of um, autonomy and, you know, a certain amount of financial ability to be able to deal with the knocks. Yeah. Um, and, I, and look, that's not for everyone. Mm-hmm. And, and and there's a risk in that as well of going too far, of finding something else that might be a little bit easier than the natural sure. struggle. So there's a balance to be had in that. But I think there's a lot of options and a lot of room to explore. And I think that, you know, if, if, the, if our idea of what being an actor, director, writer is, is becoming more of a prison than it is, yeah, um, and I think that's a good thing to question. I think there should be more room for questioning it, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think if if you can, you know, if you if you can go all in and you can make that work for you, I I applaud that, and I think that's absolutely fantastic. But as you said as well, there is that reality of the statistics showing that the percentage of people who who manage to pull that off is quite low. Um, and so I just I wonder. Yeah, I just think that that yeah, if we could completely again i do think it's improving but i still you know i still see those articles pop up again and again on twitter of like you have to go all in or um you have to sacrifice everything to be an actor or and they they yeah they really bug me um and i just think we really need to like completely remove that stigma of Mm -hmm. people have to make a living and I, i just think I just think it's so much better if you can find what I mean, if you if you do love acting, then finding a way to be able to stick at it. And maybe, it you know, maybe it depends on how you define success as well, because I guess I'm I'm not. um, I just I love doing I love acting. 
And so if I have a couple of acting projects a year, I am, I'm thrilled with that. I'm delighted with that. And obviously that's not somebody else's measure of success. So maybe if your measure of success is that you need to be doing it all the time, maybe you're happier to get out of it if you're not doing it all the time. I don't know. I mean, I mean, the all in thing is quite a seductive idea and it's a very American idea. And I think it, it's based on that idea of I can control everything mm. through my own personal autonomy. That if I just think hard enough and work hard enough, anything is possible. Now, I'm, I don't want to limit people's ideas to a degree in that, in that category, but I would say maybe for me, at least being a natural cynic, uh, I, I think the more useful way of looking at it is what's my level of influence that I can have? How might I extend that to a degree? So instead of, you know, yeah, you need to be all in. Well, where am I at the moment? What can I begin to influence? How can I grow that sort of influence around the things that I want to do? So it's more growth orientated as opposed to, it's very seductive, this idea of, if I get up at 6 a.m. every day and just believe it, I can make it. Yeah. Um, I and think I it's guess, probably not useful, maybe. It's an easy one to buy into in acting as well, isn't it? Because like we know ourselves even like even say if I'm if I'm auditioning for day player parts it's like you have nothing 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 and then you 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 um you land you get a role Mm -hmm. so it seems you know and and then you read the stories about someone who uh was you know doing day player parts and suddenly got this role in a big Netflix thing and suddenly they're in a series and suddenly they're in everything that you're watching and so it's a very easy one to buy into because you've experienced the going from nothing to having the role so there's no reason why you couldn't believe that you know you will get the Netflix series you will get all the series after that and it's that thing of um it's that thing of that that message of needing to be available 100% of the time for that to happen I think that's the that's the dangerous bit, um, because I think that can happen. But I think that you can, you know, you can build. A, I I personally think you can build like an e, a more economically stable environment that still allows that to happen. Yeah, I, I mean, another question I guess I, I'd throw out would be, you know, what are you ultimately aiming at via success as an actor? And I, yeah. I, I don't know, but I'd imagine a lot of people would be like, actually, you know, what I really want is uh, quality of life to feel like I'm really enjoying what I'm doing and stuff. And if you yeah. are in a state of perpetually being available for things, then maybe we're putting the end a bit further away. But I, I would add one thing on the statistics oh, thing. Yeah. I mean, just to add, I mean, uh, statistics are, are good indicators of generally how something, a landscape is. Mm. But I would not personally base bigger decisions on career or life on statistics you, you know i'm sure you're the same from the perspective of if i listened to the statistics at 18 i'd have never started acting obviously sure. I looked at it and went, this is insane um and you know i i act I, I that's a career that i have and had i looked at the statistics i wouldn't have done it so i would i would also look at that with caution it's yeah not as, it's a difficult clear. it's a difficult balance i think it's like it's what you said it's 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 how much it's how much control can you exert over the given situation? Um, well, I'd, I'd go with influence uh, as opposed to control, just as a language point, because control sure. for me still has that sense of, I must make this thing work. Sure. Uh, the expectation is very much like, it's a bit definite as opposed to influence is a little bit more fluid to the degree. Sure. And I don't mean influence coercively. I just yeah. mean, you know, given what I want in this situation, you know, what, where can I sure. move? But there's a, like, there is a reality, isn't there of, well, if I want to, if I want to influence my career, uh, if I want to influence my career to be outside of the norm of those statistics, I'm going to have to do something significantly different. Mm-hmm. Um I'm not sure exactly what my point is there. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that may well be the case. I think what, what I, the sense I got when you were saying that was a sense of if I want to be in that two, five percent that are, you know, making the big bucks and solo acting, then, then there's massive changes required for me to do that. Uh, yeah. And that might well be the case. I guess you could be quite extreme with that and, you know, move to LA and drop everything and, you know, commit in that way. But uh, I think for people in general and from the talks as well, actually talking to people, it's much more incremental 
And even in coaching people, you could be surprised just the small steps that people make that begin to open more doors. So it's less of that sense of, in order to be an actor that's really making career that I have to, you know, cut off my life from everything I've known and travel to somewhere else. Maybe that happens somewhere down the line, but I think it actually, for us, it's a much more naturally incremental process. Mm-hmm. It's, it's probably more, more accurate to what most people's experience of it is, of it is. Which just goes back really to the importance of, I think, building the network because, um, uh, for me anyway, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I'm interested in is just uh, building that incremental experience with the network of people that I enjoy working with. Um, and if that leads to something else, fantastic. But that's actually what I'm happy with rather than the, rather than the kind of the dream of, well, lightning might strike and I might end up in this huge series over here if I just don't do anything else so that I'm 100% available for it to happen. Um, (laughs) So, yeah, I think it goes back to building the network and making it happen incrementally for yourself. Yeah, I think there's something I think very dangerous, might be too strong a word, about the, the idea of the, you know, waiting for the lightning to strike element in that it, it, I guess, just psychologically, it takes away all autonomy for you and all sense of agency. And those are things that we kind of rely on to a degree or, or need as humans to be feeding in some way. So I think there's something about that that for a lot of people isn't particularly useful. Yeah. But I mean, the number one thing people say, I guess, when I ask them what's most important to them, uh, especially actors and anyone working in theatre and film, is collaboration. That comes in the top five so often. So I think there's a there's a clearly a need for us in the creative arts to be around people. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, I, I'd say that that networking, despite the you know the idea of it being professional development wise, it's just a need that we have to be around people that we like, <laughs> that likes the work that sure. we are interested in. So yeah. And you said you said there that it comes up often in the coaching about the or that what you notice in the coaching is that it happens more incrementally. Um, and that's it's something it's one of the it's one of the other reasons so that the, the the two reasons I wanted to have you on for a chat one was the the series of chats you've been having and the other was the fact that you are a, a career coach which I'm really interested in um and I'm just I'm curious as well obviously we're we're coming to the end of a pretty insane year um mm-hmm. pretty kind of a, a different a different year um and uh, I know that, you know, I don't know where you stand on the whole New Year's resolutions uh, kind of thing. I was just wondering <laughs> in terms of uh, being a, a career coach, what your uh, advice would be in terms of uh, coming to the end of an insane year, looking to what 2021 might be and how we might reflect on <laughs> the last year and how we might even begin to make plans for next year, what your what your thoughts on that would be. Yeah, I mean, I'd say with the New Year's resolutions, I mean, all I can really reflect on is sort of the research, uh, what works well in that category. Um, and also, I guess, because every individual is going to have their own approach to that. And some people love New Year's resolutions. I think they're great and it works for them great. And for others like myself, it really irritates me, <laughs> the idea of, of you know, New Year's resolutions. So, yeah, whatever isn't working for you, don't engage with, leave it be. Um, but I would say that there is yeah look I mean this last year has been you know madness and it's a difficult one to work as a base from because it's been so intangible what's going on I think a lot of people uh, are naturally very as a result we've all been thrown up in the air without any work and that's very debilitating I think so I think yeah there is a real need I think to a just to have the time to think about what all that means for you and where you want to go with it. But I'd say in relation to like, you know, news resolutions, I think it's really important to be reflective of things. So mm-hmm. from the perspective of you can't really change or act on anything that you're not aware of. So in a lot of coaching, a lot of it is around creating awareness around what, what is working and what's not working for people. And yeah. Quite often over the course of a conversation, someone might identify, oh yeah, I, I really hate that thing that I that is part of what I do actually. I didn't realize until I stopped to reflect back on it. But now that I recognize that, I can make a choice about what I do next. So I guess in a really basic way, uh, I would say that if you can establish a reflective practice for yourself, which would be, 
I don't know, once a month, just looking back and this, you know, you can easily, you can pick up some questions online about, you know, ways to reflect over the course of a month. But what it allows you to do is, or even a week, what it allows you to do is A, identify for yourself that progress has been made because quite often we can just forget that. We get lost in a cycle of, I'm doing things, I'm doing things and the things yeah. I want to get are not happening. So this is not working. As opposed to the reflective process just goes, oh, okay, yeah, I've seen where I've come. I can see the twists and turns. I can see that I'm working, that I'm creating things, I'm making stuff happen. And that's got a massive effect to be able to, to build on that. But we don't engage with it. Society-wise, sure. we're not encouraged to think deeply about what we've done well. <laughs> right. It's about what are you missing, essentially. So I would say for a kind of New Year's Eve thing, I'd say, uh, yeah, it's really worth taking a couple of hours, two or three hours. I mean, what I used to like doing was just taking two or three hours and you'll find loads of questions online if you like Google search. 50 questions about personal growth or whatever. Um, some of them are really good because we can naturally get stuck at the level of problem solving. So we can naturally, when we think about our careers, go, what isn't working? There isn't enough actors getting enough work. How do I fix that problem? Right. And a lot of coaching is around solution-focused ways around that. So I guess the, the sort of analogy of the metaphor is very much, you know, if you're on an airplane and you're going down and the engine's broken, problem-focused thinking is about let's stay in the plane and fix the problem. Solution-focused thinking is very much going, well, what I ultimately want to get mm -hmm. to be on the ground safely in one piece. And so right. a solution-focused approach might not spend a lot of time thinking about the problem, the engine. You know, Barry, who went solution-focused way, is out the window with a parachute because he's focused in a different way. And so we don't always necessarily sure. have to fix the problem. So spending some time reflectively to figure out. Uh, so some of those questions, I guess you'd find in those, you know, 50 personal growth questions are about avoiding the problem because we can get limited on focusing on that only and never looking at what I actually want. Right. And if you engage a bit more with that, there may be other ways around to it. So spending some time, you know, give yourself two or three hours, whatever, some of those questions. Um, so when you... Then, Go on. When you when you say you, you said New Year's resolutions are not something that really work for you, um, it, it, when you say that, do you mean um, do you mean because you prefer to do it? You prefer to do something similar on a more regular basis, or do you mean because they they tend to be problem focused? Or what, what uh, did you I, mean? I, well, I, I'd say that there's an inherent problem with the New Year's resolution thing, which is just that it's it's an idea and it's not wrapped up with anything else. So right. if you want to change behavior in some way, it needs to be a bit more ingrained and rooted. So, for example, I guess, you know, if you did a wonderful New Year's resolution about something you wanted to do, the next step would be to identify, well, what are the behaviors attached to that? So if I want to be working in a Netflix series at the end of the year, uh, that's a great New Year's resolution to have. But what are the behaviors associated with that? Sure. A, um, so what can I begin to put in place that I'm doing on a regular basis? What's the overall sort of aspiration I'm looking with this? So you're engaging a bit mentally the intention of, of where you're heading with it. Sure. Um, and then environment as well is another key element. So going, okay, what do I need to do around the house? Who do I need to be around collaboratively? What space and time do I need to cut off for myself to enable those behaviors that might bring me closer to that thing? So all of these steps, we're looking at the kind of what are you what you're doing cognitively, what are you doing just in in time and space wise, what are the actual things you'll be doing behavior wise, that all builds up to generating something. That's an integrated process as opposed to, yeah, news resolution is to be in a Netflix series, great intention, sure. but how do we pin it down to something that we'll be doing? So I guess that's what I I mean, and also those New Year's resolutions, or I guess when you're trying to think about what I need to do quite often the first thing we'll, we'll naturally go to is how do I fix the problem as opposed right. to what do I really want to do? And I, one more question. I'm just curious, and this might be, this might be an impossible question and it's probably just because I'm coming at it from my own uh, perspective, but be, uh, you mentioned about, um, you know, use the example of actors don't get enough work. What is the solution? Um, what would the solution based focus be for that? So, and I'm just curious that in your work, how often does making your own work come up or how often do you find that you end up guiding people to making their own work in those types of instances? 
Yeah, I mean, it, I, I guess I've, I've worked a lot with producers and writers. Uh, right. And, and for them, that's naturally in there to a degree. Uh, and I think with actors, yeah, I, I think there's something, there's something particularly difficult in acting in that there is the sense of not being able to create something, perhaps, and that can be a barrier to actually starting anything. Um, so a lot of actors would go to that route, and I think it's a good way of going, not necessarily committing to, you know, anything that gets you moving, anything that's creating a bit of momentum is good uh, if someone's in a position of sort of stagnation and not particularly happy with it. Um, so a lot of people would come up with that idea of maybe there's something I can do there, but it, it's not always writing. It can even it can also be around, I just need to be in a space where I'm acting with others. Even if that's an online thing that I'm doing, uh, those are the two routes, I guess, actors that I've worked with have sort of come up with. But anything that's engaging some form of momentum is, because we don't know what's necessarily going to happen next week. But sure. if there's a momentum in there and we're acting on stuff, we are putting ourselves out into the world and things are changing that we can react to. And that's, I mean, the, the thing with, I guess, long form goal orientated stuff is that it's not particularly useful in, in our modern world, which as we well know from this year changes so quickly. So really what you need is a, a way of working that is open to what's changing around you, but has a general sense of where you're going. Right. I hope that makes sense with, if I, or just added more vagary to it. <laughs> no, yeah, it's really interesting. And, and I knew it was, it was kind of an impossible question really, because it was just, uh, it's just something that's, that is on uh, my mind quite a lot. Um, and mostly, again, mostly because I, I keep finding myself coming back to the idea of making my own work and mm -hmm. yet never actually taking the plunge um, to do so. So I was, that's why I was kind of just curious about that. Um, but I'm sure we'll talk more about that uh, another time. Um, I mean, really, really briefly on that. Look, that's that's really common for a lot of people. I, I definitely have that as well. It's it's that step of just stepping out of a, a comfort zone and doing something slightly different. So it's... It's a very natural thing. And that's a process that takes a few iterations, a few cycles before you begin to yeah, move out of it. So it's, yeah, don't, don't yeah. feel odd as a result. It's, uh, it's just funny when you, you, you keep, um, it's funny when you notice that resistance in yourself and you notice that you keep changing the excuse as they, as they come along. So at first it's like, well, uh, you know, I, I can't write. And then you write something and you go, well, I've written something now, but actually I, I don't like it. And then you go, so I really need a writer, but I don't, I don't know any writers. And then your wife happens to be a writer and she writes something and you think, oh yeah, that's great. And then you still don't make it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh, right. What, am, what am I at here? <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of the things I guess uh, are not necessarily about our capability to do stuff. Yeah. You know, I, I've worked with a few writers who have, they're published writers and I was initially surprised by the idea that they felt like they couldn't write. And of course, you bring up the thing of, well, you know, I, I can see that you're a published writer. So surely that I wouldn't hold it up to them in that way. But the capability quite often for us isn't the problem. We can write if we if we need to. If there's a gun to your head, Frank, I'm sure yeah. you might write something by the end of the day. So it's it's other things. It's accountability and it's what's the motivation for doing it and those yeah. elements. Yeah. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for coming on for a chat. Um, if, uh, if somebody did want to engage with you uh, in terms of the, the career coaching, how would they get in touch with you or what's the process? Uh, yeah, great question. Yeah, I guess you could go to my website, which is uh, www.andrewmacklin.com uh, or find me at actthemacklin on Twitter. And uh, I recognize, obviously, for yeah, all of us, uh, it's been a financially traumatic time, potentially, not all of us, but most of us. But in January, what I'll be doing is I'll, I'll be just offering five hours of just free coaching, just strategy sessions, just clearing the decks for people, getting clear on yeah, where they are at the moment, at the end of 2020, where they want to go, and just some clear strategies around how you might embed that and how you might move forward. So, uh, yeah, if you keep a, if you follow me on Twitter, uh, I'll keep updates on that for January, because I just think that, yeah. Um, yeah, the government might not be offering it, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure. yeah, it's, it's a good thing to, to offer out. So, um, yeah, that sounds interested. that sounds fantastic. It sounds extremely extremely generous. Um, brilliant. Uh, well, again, thank you so much. I've really yeah really enjoyed chatting with you, and um, yeah, I'm sure I'll chat to you, chat to you again soon. Excellent, Thanks. Frank. Thanks so much. It's been a joy. Thanks.
Thank you so much for listening and thank you for all of your support since I started the podcast back in May. I would love to know what parts of the podcast you've been enjoying, uh, what you'd like to hear more of or what you'd like to hear less of, uh, or even who you'd recommend that I chat to in the new year. So email me on frank at mysite.actor or connect with me on Twitter at Frankie P. That's F-R-A-N-K-I-E-P. Uh, and uh, yeah, give me any any feedback you have. I'd love to hear it. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas and I look forward to more chats in the new year. Take care. Thank you for listening. Chat soon. <laughs>